Okay. Good evening. Um, I am um, Alvaro Chavarria, Assistant Professor of Physics, and I would like to welcome you to this Autumn's Frontiers of Physics lecture. The Frontiers of Physics lecture series brings to the University of Washington and the Seattle community world-class scientists to explain to you the most exciting developments and discoveries in physics. The Frontiers of Physics started in 2015 when Dr. Patrick O'Hara and Dr. Katarina Randolph approached our department with the vision for a public lecture series. We have so far, show, so far showcased 14 outstanding presentations by top figures in the field, including eight Nobel laureates. The topics cover a wide range of phenomena from the early universe to the present, from the extragalactic scale to the microscopic world of quantum mechanics, from abstract theoretical concepts to the subtleties of otherwise familiar ideas. The lecture series is only possible by the work of a diverse and spirited committee with members of the faculty and our community who have joined Dr. O'Hara and Dr. Randolph in their vision. I am very happy to be able to join you here in Kane Hall. Many of you are part of the University of Washington community, including friends of our department and the College of Arts and Sciences. We also have guests from the broader community in Seattle and many others that have traveled far to join us. I would like to give a special mention to Mr. Gallagher's class from Port Angeles High School, who have made coming to the Frontiers of Physics lecture series an educational tradition. We're very glad to have you here. And, and finally, I, I would like to thank you all who could, couldn't make it in person, but are still uh, joining us on our live stream. Uh, this evening, it is my pleasure to introduce Nobel Laureate Professor Arthur MacDonald, who will be presenting about the resolution of the solar neutrino problem and, dis and the discovery of neutrino oscillations, for which he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2015. Professor MacDonald will also talk about Snow Lab, a premier underground research facility in Canada, which is focused on astroparticle physics, including the search for particles that make the dark matter in our universe. Arthur McDonald was born in Sydney, Nova Scotia, Canada. He received his bachelor and master's degree from Dalhousie University and his PhD from Caltech. Throughout his career, he was a research officer at Chuck River Laboratories, professor at Princeton University, professor at Queen's University, and then the great chair um, in particle astrophysics, a title he still holds now as chair emeritus. Since 1989, he has been the director of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory uh, Scientific Collaboration, and among many awards, he is a Companion of the Order of Canada, co-recipient of the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics and 2007 Benjamin Franklin Medal, the 2016 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, and the 2013 Cockney Prize of the European Physical Society with the Snow Collaboration. He's a member of the Royal Societies of Canada and the United Kingdom, Foreign Associate of the United States National Academy of Sciences, and a Fellow of the American Physical Society. Following today's lecture, we will have our traditional Q&A with Professor McDonald, where you can li line up on the microphones on the two sides of the auditorium uh, and ask anything that you like. Uh, you, should all, you should have all received one of uh, these brochures. Oh, I guess I left mine down there, but you have a brochure, uh, which highlights uh, some of the contributions of the University of Washington to, to the Nobel Prize uh, winning research that Professor McDonald will talk about. Uh, the research in this field of astroparticle physics and neutrino physics continues at the university uh, with, within the Center for Experimental Nuclear Physics and Astrophysics. We host ADMX, a leading dark matter search, Project 8, which aims to perform the most sensitive measurement of the mass of the neutrino, and we play leading roles in off-site, deep underground experiments like DAMIC and LEGEND. In the brochure, you can also find a QR code that will take you to our website so you can sign up to our mailing list, view our past lectures, learn about upcoming events, and learn how to support the Department of Physics. Please join me in welcoming Professor Arthur McDonald. So it's a real honor 
and a pleasure for me to be here this evening. I, uh, uh, you heard all those awards that I've received, and uh, really I received them as a representative of a, of a large group of people who actually did the, the work on the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory and other things we've, we've developed, and uh, I just try to represent them well, and in this case, uh, that group of people for the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory included a substantial number of people from the University of Washington and uh, significant roles being played in the, uh, in the project uh, by uh, Professor Hamish Robertson and others. And uh, so I uh, uh, am here in part to tell you about what was done here at the University of Washington that contributed to a Nobel Prize and also to uh, say thank you for uh, all the things that were contributed by the University of Washington to our scientific success. Um, we attempt to understand the universe by doing studies deep underground. And, and, and the reason we uh, uh, go deep underground is to avoid this, which is uh, the Northern Lights uh, over the place where we have our detector situated in a mine uh, near Sudbury, Ontario. And the, the origin of the no Northern Lights is very similar uh, to uh, the interference that we would have in our detectors from cosmic rays. Uh, we would have our detectors glowing in a similar fashion from those cosmic rays if we were not uh, in a situation where we are two kilometers underground here in a very active nickel mine a uh, very uh, uh, productive mine due to the ore body uh, of nickel and copper ore. And uh, uh, we are able to suppress those cosmic rays by about a factor of a million. And so ultimately with this Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, we were able to observe neutrinos from the sun uh, roughly one an hour. And uh, without that suppression of the uh, cosmic rays, uh, they would have been obscured completely by uh, uh, the effects of the cosmic rays making our detector glow. We also have been able, subsequent to the uh, Sudbury Neutrino Observatory work, to expand the laboratory about three times the total excavated volume. It is now called Snow Lab, and there are uh, a number of experiments there that are studying uh, not only uh, neutrino physics and properties of neutrinos beyond what we have been able to observe uh, with the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, but also uh, studies of dark matter. Because when you look out on a starry night, if you don't have the northern lights obscuring it, uh, you have five times as much mass in the region between the stars as you do in the stars themselves. Uh, quite remarkable. Uh, this phenomenon is referred to as dark matter. Uh, it, it has uh, various potential forms. We do not understand what it is. Um, we understand very well, however, what its influence is through gravity. And so by going underground, we can study uh, a tremendous number of areas of the universe around us. I mentioned the sun. We study neutrinos which are basic building blocks of nature along with electrons and quarks. They're the three things that we don't know how to subdivide any further. But we also studied the way in which the sun is powered, the nuclear reactions that power the sun and create the fantastic energy that we all rely upon here on Earth. We're able to study the Earth itself in the sense that neutrinos are emitted by uranium and thorium in the Earth which contributes about 40% of the heat flow out from the Earth, and we can study them, study that effect for several hundred kilometers down into the Earth, much farther than you can by other techniques by studying these neutrinos. We're able to study dark matter, which is what holds our Milky Way into its current pattern. And not only that, it is the sort of thing that has substantial influence all the way to the outer boundaries of the universe, it is what uh, contributes significantly to the formation of uh, galaxies and stars subsequent to the Big Bang. And so we really are studying all the way to the outer reaches of the universe by studying 
dark matter in these underground laboratories. So we study how do stars like our sun burn and how do they create the elements from which we are made? Uh, hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all are affected substantially by the nuclear reactions that power the sun. And so our very molecular makeup is affected by the way in which the sun has generated the elements. We study the basic laws of physics. We've learned new things about these very fundamental particles called neutrinos. And we also study overall what is the composition of our universe, but even more significantly, how has it evolved to the present day? We really are studying our origins, not just as humans, but also the origins of the world that we live in. And so it's very fundamental in its nature. And if you go in the other direction, if you go in the microscopic direction, then you have a model which is remarkably accurate in understanding how atoms work, how uh, the uh, structure of uh, the uh, fundamental particles contributes to uh, what we recognize in the matter around us. Quarks, electrons, and neutrinos are the three fundamental types of particles that make up the matter as we know it. The representative of this first column of the classification in the elementary particle standard model is what affects the matter that we are made from and that our stars are made from and things that we understand in the world around us. Inside an atom, there is the nucleus. Inside that nucleus, there are protons and neutrons, and around it, there are electrons, and those electrons are what give it, that atom, its chemical properties, and that's what defines how that atom combines in our bodies and how it affects things in the world around us. Inside those neutrons and protons, it has now been determined that there are other particles called quarks, uh, which combine in numbers of three to produce either a single charge, positive, for the proton, or neutral, zero charge, for the neutron. That comes out of these basic building blocks in the uh, uh, standard model. The unusual particle is this neutrino, which uh, really feels only one of the forces of nature, which are represented on the right here. The photon represents the electromagnetic interaction, which really governs most of our, uh, most of our lives in terms of uh, interactions of things. The gluon represents the strong interaction that holds quarks inside protons and neutrons, and also it holds them inside nuclei. And then finally, there's the weak interaction, which is represented by two, as they're called, force carriers here, Z and W. Neutrinos are very unusual particles in the sense that there were enormous numbers produced in the original Big Bang. There are enormous numbers being produced in the sun by the nuclear reactions that power the sun. On a, on a space about the size of your thumbnail, there are about five million of the type we were detecting going through that area of your body every second. That's hard to believe. Only once in your lifetime, because these are so infrequently interacting with matter, only once in your lifetime will one of those neutrinos stop and change one atom into something else. And probably only if it happens to hit you in the eye, and if your eye happens to be closed, as it often is at this point in one of these lectures I'm giving, <laughs> would you observe anything? You might observe a, a tiny, faint burst of light if that were the case, and it's those tiny, tiny faint bursts of light as a neutrino changes something into something else that we build these very sensitive detectors the size of a 10-story building in order to observe that uh, once an hour. But by doing so, we can understand those nuclear reactions that created the neutrinos, and that's part of the objective of what we are, uh, uh, what we are trying to do. They're also produced in uh, uh, every time there's a radioactive beta decay 
uh, here on Earth, and uh, so they, in smaller numbers they occur with radioactive sources. In this model, and apparently in the way things have evolved in the universe, each of these particles has a antiparticle, a particle that has the opposite charge and is constituted in such a way that it uh, actually will uh, uh, annihilate. Uh, an electron, for example, is annihilated by contact with a positron. Positrons being emitted in certain forms of radioactive decay. And when they are annihilated uh, by finding an electron, uh, then they produce back-to-back -back gammas. And that's very valuable in positron emission tomography, PET scanning, as you may have heard in medicine. It's simple. You simply put detectors on either side of the thing that's being analyzed, very often someone's head, and by connecting the lines, you can figure out where that radioactivity that you had injected into someone's arm has ma made its way and uh, is affecting uh, the head. Uh, perhaps a tumor area can be identified by this, for example. So matter and antimatter are fundamental parts of our universe, but you don't see that happening here. There aren't equal amounts of antimatter in this room producing bursts of gamma rays. And we wonder where all that antimatter that we think was produced in the original Big Bang has gone. How has it decayed away? And that's one of the fundamental things that we're trying to investigate as we go forward. So we found when we made our measurements that neutrinos have a, a mass, a, a finite, as it's called, rest mass. This was not a part of the theory before we started our measurements, and, and it is a a way in which neutrinos are different than the other particles, which generally get their mass from uh, the actions of something called the Higgs boson, which was uh, uh, very publicly uh, described, uh, having been discovered at the CERN accelerator uh, a few years ago. And so they're different from that point of view, and we hope that that information can be used to understand what becomes ultimately what is often referred to as the theory of everything. In other words, this standard model, which is extremely accurate, still has missing parts. Another thing that's missing is this dark matter material that I mentioned that is certainly there in terms of its uh, existence in the universe, but we don't know what it is, and certainly we don't know how it uh, uh, is created, with, uh, how it would fit inside this theory. It's got to be something different than anything that I have on the list here. So let's start by talking about neutrinos <clears throat> and how we detected them with the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. As I said, they are basic particles. We don't know how to subdivide them any further, and scientists are always very careful to say, this is as much as we know today. Uh, we have many times been fooled in the past into uh, having to change our, our mind, and we're happy to do so if we have new information. They come in three flavors, as you saw in that previous diagram, electron, mu, and tau. And uh, they only feel the weak force. That means that they only stop if they hit the nucleus of an atom or the electron going around it head on. And so they can travel through a, a, an amount of lead corresponding to the distance that light travels in a year, about a million billion kilometers of lead, with only a 50% chance of striking something. Or once in your lifetime and even less frequently in your eye. That makes them very difficult to detect and therefore their properties were very little known and uh, are, we are still looking at some of the basic things associated with that. In the standard model, they do not have a, did not have a finite mass and they did not change between electron neutrinos and other types, which is in fact what we observed uh, that is, in its essence, a reason to think that they have a finite mass. So, as I said, what we built was something that uh, was, first of all, two kilometers underground. There's a, a picture of it here. It's 34 meters high, roughly the size of a 10-story building. And in the center of it is uh, uh, an unusual material called heavy water. It's uh, deuterium oxide rather than hydrogen oxide naturally occurring, roughly one in, 60, one in 6,400 
of the molecules in, in, in this water are actually heavier than the regular H2O. Otherwise, very similar in, its, in, in their properties. But for us, the extra neutron that makes that deuterium in the D2O heavier is in fact the target for the neutrinos in one of the reactions that we study. Very important in terms of what we're able to do in measuring neutrinos from the sun. This uh, sphere is an acrylic vessel, which is five centimeters thick, two inches thick, <clears throat> but, but 12 meters uh, in diameter. And uh, as it says in your brochure, the supervision overall of the construction of that was done by someone from the University of Washington, Peter Doe. And uh, we're very indebted to Peter for all his contribution to this project. It's surrounded by uh, light sensors, about 10,000 of them, and they are in a gigantic water tank, and the D2O and the water surrounding it are all highly purified. The cavity is lined with material that prevents water from leaking out and also prevents radon from the uranium in the rock. You may have heard of radon in your basements. Well, this is kind of the ultimate basement two kilometers down, and, and we're trying to prevent that radon from getting into our detector. In fact, we try to make everything out of ultra-pure materials, particularly with respect to uranium and thorium, in order to avoid, now that we've gotten rid of the cosmic rays, in order to avoid anything else that interferes with the signals we're looking for. And so that's what was constructed. Now, it was constructed by a, a very elaborate process, a big engineering task, you can see on the upper left here a, uh, uh, the last pieces being put in of the 120 pieces that were used to construct that acrylic sphere uh, on, a, on a jig here to hold them in place. You can see after it has been constructed and before the last part of the, uh, uh, of the light sensors were installed. And finally, this is it after it's been completed. You can see the cables that are running up to a computer system which again, John Wilkerson, who when he was here at the University of Washington was in charge of the data uh, uh, acquisition system for the uh, experiment. And so again, a significant University of Washington contribution. The process then we're to, that we're talking about is the following, where two nuclei come together and fuse in the sun and produce neutrinos, enormous numbers. This particular picture actually follows just one of them, one that happens to be heading for Sudbury towards our detector. You can see it, it's gone through the solar system, it's now going underground and heading for our detector, and when it gets there, it makes a burst of light. And that burst of light is what we're looking for with these large numbers of uh, phototubes. Um, we actually have uh, some very unique signatures creating bursts of light in our detector. Uh, and the first one uh, where uh, you need that deuterium in the D2O is one which is very specific to the only type of neutrinos that are produced in the sun, electron neutrinos. And you can see the electron neutrino coming in from the right in this pictorial example of, a, of the nuclear reaction. It interacts with the neutron producing a proton and a fast-moving electron going faster than the speed of light in water. Now, you may have, uh, have heard that nothing goes faster than the speed of light. That's true in a vacuum. It's not true in materials. In fact, it's the change in the speed of light in, 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 in glass that enables your, your uh, glasses to work and focus uh, <clears throat> the light uh, on your, uh, on your uh, eye. Um, and so, when the electrons go faster than the speed of light in water, they produce a cone of light. There's another reaction in which the, in which the neutrino, any of the three, electron, muon, or tau, simply break apart the deuterium into a neutron and a proton. And we had three different ways to detect these neutrons, including uh, a, a way that was very specific to observing those neutrons that was developed here uh, under Hamish Robertson's um, leadership uh, together with the Los Alamos 
uh, uh, National Lab uh, and was a significant part of the uh, data taking for the experiment. So thinking about if you're trying to understand if neutrinos change from the electron neutrinos produced in the sun to something else, if in fact the second reaction, <coughs> which measures all neutrino types, was matched by the first reaction, which is measuring the electron neutrinos, that means that all neutrino types are electrons. That's the only thing that's a, a part of it. But in fact, what we observed <coughs> is that there were only about a third of the total number of neutrino types that were still electron neutrinos as measured by the first reaction. That was the major discovery that implied that neutrinos change their type and therefore have a finite mass. And that is what the Nobel Prize was awarded for because it really was uh, a new understanding of how neutrinos uh, interact in many different ways in the universe. If they have a finite mass, it makes a significant effect. It had to be done very carefully. The radioactivity had to be very strongly controlled and also measured because gamma rays from uranium and thorium were capable of breaking apart uh, the deuterium in the same way as that uh, second reaction does. Uh, they can substitute for a neutrino. And what we were able to do was to first of all, constrain the radioactivity to a very high degree. In, in the middle of the detector, we had about a billion times lower radioactivity than even you would find in tap water, about a part in 10 to the 15th uranium and thorium in, uh, in the central region. Um, and uh, uh, that way, uh, we restricted that as a, uh, uh, as a possible spurious uh, result, but in addition, we were able to measure it to uh, about 20 to 30 percent, and so we were able to actually determine what the background from that was. But when it came to a final determination of how, uh, of the fact that there were neutrons being detected there, there was, was a, a very re remarkable technological uh, 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 activity that took place here at the University of Washington where uh, detectors specifically of neutrons, 400 meters of them, uh, that themselves were ultra low background. They didn't add significantly to the background of the, uh, the very low radioactivity I just mentioned for the water itself. They were put together uh, from uh, three different segments that are, were welded together at the top of the detector because we didn't have the headroom to have the full 12 meters that some of them represented uh, above the detector when we started to install them. They were flown in with a submarine, a remotely operated vehicle, ROV as we called it. Um, so if you had a chance in the 1990s to get a, a submarine, uh, what color would you pick if you were given different picks? So anyone would pick a yellow submarine, right? So that's what we did. And uh, so, uh, Unfortunately, uh, there's a little more to it, and that is that yellow paint was far too radioactive. <laughs> there's no way that we could tolerate that. And so what you see on the left here is a picture looking down into the detector, and you see the prosaic green that we had eventually when we stripped all that paint off and uh, didn't add any radioactivity to the experiment. The other thing that was interesting was that nobody over the age of 23 could possibly fly one of those things or pilot it in the, uh, in spite of all of us older folks trying to do it, no way we could do it. We needed the video generation to be able to do it. And so we trusted this activity to our students and postdocs, including a number of them from uh, the University of Washington who trained themselves for this activity. So ultimately, this is a summary of the sort of measurements that we made. On the left is a measure of the number of neutrinos reaching the detector and producing a signal in either the first uh, of those reactions that I mentioned that is specific to electron neutrinos or the second one, uh, all neutrino types. The crosshatch up here is the predictions 
of how the sun burns in terms of producing neutrinos. And the total number of all neutrinos matched extremely well with the calculations of how the sun burns. Prior to that time, all the experiments that had been done uh, when we started in 1984 on this experiment, before our final results in 2001 and 2002, in 1984 there was one previous measurement by Ray Davis in uh, South Dakota of neutrinos from the sun, and only one third of what was predicted is what he observed, basically in agreement with what we found when we measured specifically the electron neutrino flux. But at that time, you couldn't tell whether there was a problem with that experiment or whether there was a problem with the calculations of how the sun burns, and therefore there was what had come to be known as the solar neutrino problem. And this resolved it very clearly by showing two things. One, neutrinos do change from one type or flavor as we sometimes call them. Uh, you can't taste them, but that's, physicists like a little bit of whimsy. Uh, so the, the flavor of electron neutrinos, two-thirds of them had changed into the flavors of muon and tau. We also showed through this measurement that the calculations of how the sun burns was very accurate. And so uh, uh, quite a significant uh, uh, finding. Um, this is a summary of the results of that experiment. Uh, first of all, as I said, showing the neutrinos change from one type to another, have a finite mass. Secondly, understanding how the sun burns <clears throat> and thereby understanding uh, how the calculations that indicate how the various elements that make up our, our universe right now, including our own bodies, uh, were created in the sun. And understanding that in detail is also of benefit in the sense that the calculations of how the sun burns are very similar to the calculations that you have to do if you want to confine the sun in a bottle, which is what fusion power, which because of that heavy water, one in 6,000 of the, of, the, uh, of the molecules of water is a heavy water, it would be the fuel for what's called fusion power, where instead of holding this very hot plasma with, a gra with gravity as it happens in the sun, instead what you're doing is attempting to hold it with magnetic fields. You're trying to curl the particles that are trying to escape back into the center without touching the walls. And so we now know essentially full scale that those calculations are very accurate and that's of value when it comes to trying to understand how to build such a, uh, an, a, a, a nuclear uh, a fusion reactor here on Earth. But finally, it also led to the establishment of Snow Lab, as I mentioned earlier on, um, to try to develop experiments in this very low radioactivity environment uh, to uh, detect dark matter. When we first started, we thought neutrinos might be the dark matter, but we now know that they do have a mass, but it's too small in order for it to represent the dark matter. So 270 authors on our papers, and the ones in, in red are the ones from the University of Washington. And so you can see just how significant that uh, set of people is in terms of the project. And, uh, uh, and I'm very grateful to them for their, for their contributions to the project. So let's move on and, and, and talk about dark matter. In particular, let's talk about the Big Bang Theory. Uh, not that Big Bang Theory, uh, but this Big Bang Theory. Uh, but one of the interesting things about this Nobel Prize thing is you sometimes get opportunities to do fun things. And it turns out the guy who was the technical advisor to the Big Bang Theory basically throughout uh, the full course of the, of the program was, was a student of ours at Princeton uh, back when I was a professor there in the 1980s. And he, I think he actually did a great job. The, the science was quite accurate. The things written on the blackboard were correct. And so uh, I had a chance to be geek of the week. They uh, occasionally invite uh, scientists to come and sit in on one of the filmings, and, uh, and, and that was kind of fun. But seriously, we understand a tremendous amount about what has happened since the Big Bang. And this is a general description of it now. Uh, we think that about uh, 13 and a half 
the, the number is now 13 and a half, it says 15 here, but we think about 13 and a half billion years ago, there was a, an enormous explosion and expansion that happened and uh, enough energy was generated at that time that through this process of, of the reverse of annihilation of matter and antimatter, instead you have energy being converted into matter and antimatter, uh, there were quarks, uh, electrons, neutrinos produced in enormous numbers, equal amounts we think of matter and antimatter, but there's still a very big question mark there, and that is what happened to all that antimatter? It decayed away to a very large degree, but understanding that process these days theoretically is, is, is most favorably considered through uh, neutrino in neutrino effects that were occurring back in that day, asymmetries that enabled antimatter to decay away and the remainder of the matter to make up the universe as we understand it. And some of the symmetry properties that we're looking for can be studied in a very rare radioactivity called neutrinoless double beta decay. And we have in fact converted the SNOW experiment to SNOW plus to study exactly this. And there are other experiments being studied here at uh, by people from University of Washington that address the same question. Same question. So after about uh, 10 to the minus uh, six seconds uh, from the Big Bang, you have a point where quarks are able to clump together and form neutrons and protons. And after about uh, uh, three minutes, the neutrons and protons uh, actually have formed into nuclei the light nuclei and first. And then uh, after about 300,000 years, the electrons uh, have, uh, are able to attach to the atoms. All of this happening because after the explosion, there's a tremendous expansion which cools the whole process and you can see the temperatures declining. It's only 10,000 degrees Celsius at the point where the atoms form. And at that point, there's quite a remarkable uh, set of, uh, of uh, uh, things that happen that can be studied uh, by the astronomers and that give us a, a, a picture of this all happening and fitting together very well. After about a billion years, uh, the uh, things that have been formed, the atoms that have been formed, form into galaxies and stars. And now 13 and a half billion years after the Big Bang, we have the universe as we find it today. But this picture of how this works is, is now quite well defined and it fits all of the data. The measurements we're trying to do to understand this matter, antimatter asymmetry, as well as other properties of neutrinos that affect the universe, uh, are one example of this is converting the SNOW experiment to what's now called SNOW plus, putting in that experiment uh, a liquid scintillator, uh, with, uh, which required the uh, addition of these ropes to hold down the central volume instead of holding it up because it was heavier than the surrounding water. And, we're, and after uh, a, a lot of work now in running with just the scintillator in there, we're about to install the tellurium in 2024 and get on with a measurement of neutrinoless double beta decay. There's a picture of what it looks like now. Neutrinoless double beta decay is a process where in a single beta decay, uh, you would have an electron emitted from a radioactive material along with a neutrino. If you're in a situation where only two of those processes are energetically allowed and the single one is not, then you could have a spectrum which looks like this continuous spectrum here, the blue one, uh, which is representative of something that is uh, 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 two neutrino double beta decay as called. Uh, however, there are cases where if the neutrino is its own antiparticle, and since it has no charge, it is not restricted from being that, and if that is the case, then no neutrinos are emitted. You only have the two electrons emitted. If you sum up their energies, you end up with a peak at the end of this continuous spectrum. And we are doing a study of this with SNOW plus 
here at the University of Washington. They have worked on the Majorana experiment with germanium-76 and are now working on the legend experiment, one of the leaders in the field as well. The lifetimes are enormously long, 10 to the 26th years. And so you have to collect a large amount of material and then wait for maybe 10 years to try to look for this process. If you remember Avogadro's number, six times 10 to the 23, that's the, the uh, uh, number of atoms in a, in a molecular weight of a material. And uh, so if you collect four tons, for example, of, uh, uh, of tellurium, as we're doing in this experiment, then you can make such measurements by waiting five to 10 years and having all of the background uh, suppressed. Uh, in a low radioactivity location as we have. And what you can see here is the red is what we might expect to see at the current limits. And uh, uh, that is the reason that we're pursuing this because we have pretty good sensitivity doing this. Now, there's another way in which you can look at neutrino mass, and that is by studying the end point of a particularly favorable radioactive decay, the decay of tritium. And uh, once again, the University of Washington people are uh, very much involved in this. Uh, there's Peter Doe and Hamish Robertson in the collaboration photo of this enormous experiment called Katrin that is situated in Karlsruhe, where there is an enormous amount of tritium uh, stored in a uh, repository there. Um, and uh, uh, that experiment is also uh, similar sensitivity, really, to um, the uh, uh, sensitivity we will get with neutrinos double beta decay for the mass of neutrinos, in all cases about a million times more sensitive than the mass of an electron. Now, to go on with the Big Bang theory, uh, I mentioned that at uh, 300,000 years, at that point the light begins to shine through, and there's absolutely remarkable measurements have been made of, of things that are, of, of what is called the cosmic background radiation, which is uh, uh, actually uh, back when televisions were first on the, uh, were first, uh, uh, on the market and you were looking at uh, things with an antenna, about 1% of the snow that you saw at that time actually uh, came from the early universe, although uh, it, was, it had to be detected with uh, exquisite detectors in order to show that that's the case. This curve that you see here is a, uh, if you look at this bottom curve down here, you, you can't quite see it in this. There's a lot of data points, but the average of them is the red dots. And the blue line is the theory that corresponds to that evolution that I showed you in the general figure of how the world has evolved since the Big Bang. If there were more, no dark matter, then this particular peak in this curve would be much smaller. And there are other very major elements as to how we know that dark matter is there. But this, which is a plot of the uh, structure on, on the sky, uh, of uh, the angular structure is represented in this figure, uh, the power spectrum as it's called for, for uh, how much power there is at, at various angular um, uh, apertures on the sky uh, is, is an absolutely remarkable to me uh, measure of how well one can understand with this theory that goes through all the points what has happened since the universe was originally created. But there's still a big puzzle and that is what is this dark matter it makes up, we think, about five times the mass of the glowing matter that we see in the universe, and it strongly influences the evolution of the universe. And there are other examples that indicate to us that it's there. For one thing, our Milky Way galaxy, which it's actually sort of a pancake. If you look out at a night sky and you see the Milky Way, it's a band of stars that you see across the sky, but that's because you're looking through the pancake. In other galaxies similar to ours, if you look from the side, as you can see in this figure here, it's, a, it's actually more like a cinnamon roll. It's a spiral. <laughs> and uh, if you plot the velocities of the stars that are in the outer region, 
as is done in this figure here, uh, you don't have enough mass in the glowing material to hold them in those orbits. You need five times as much mass that isn't glowing uh, in the central region. Using general relativity, you can also see effects, it's called lensing, uh, of uh, a galaxy behind another one where uh, the object from that, the, the, the image from that galaxy is blurred by that uh, uh, matter in between. And in other cases, this is a classic case where two clusters of galaxies collided. Uh, the pink material in the middle is ordinary matter that you would observe with, uh, with X-rays. And, and it's, it's impeded by the fact that those two clumps of, of matter interfere with each other. The blue is the inference of how much dark matter is there by using that gravitational lensing effect. And that just passes through as though there's no interactions whatsoever. So there are two major candidates for this dark matter these days. One of them is weakly interacting massive particles, so WIMPs. As I said, physicists love a little bit of wimps, a little bit of whimsy. So in this case, we've got uh, a bunch of geeks looking for wimps. That's what we're we're doing actually in most of our measurements. Um, another way to describe dark matter is axion particles, and they are being uh, be, being sought in one of the best experiments in the world, the ADMX experiment here at the University of Washington. We think that the composition of the world as a whole right now is only about 4% us, 4% ordinary matter, 26% this dark matter I mentioned, and about 70% if you express it in terms of energy, the so-called dark energy, which is actually observed from the fact that uh, if you measure the stars that are uh, farthest away from us, it appears as though gravity is not what you were taught in school, an attractive force entirely. There's a small component which is repulsive, and that is what has accelerated the expansion of the universe, and that can be represented as an energy which is a part of the total. So I say we understand our universe pretty well, um, but we don't know what dark matter is. We don't know what dark energy is, really. Uh, I'm re re reminded of uh, Donald Rumsfeld and his known knowns and this is a bunch of known unknowns that we're dealing with in this case, dark matter and dark energy. But we're hard on, hard, hot on the trail of both of these. In the case of the study of weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs, uh, what we're trying to do is to present targets for the WIMPs as they approach our uh, detectors here on Earth to uh, collide with various nuclei, and we have different techniques for trying to uh, suppress the other background in addition to just being underground and having high standards of, of keeping radioactivity out of our experiments. Um, and so what we look for is a recoil of uh, the uh, uh, nucleus that has been hit by a WIMP, uh, and that creates light in some cases in our detectors, and other effects in other types of detectors. Uh, in the case of liquid argon, which is one of the experiments I work on, if you have a nuclear recoil, you get pulses of light in about seven nanoseconds, whereas if you have gammas or betas, normal radioactivity, it's about one and a half microseconds, uh, a substantial difference, like a factor of 500. And so we can digitize every pulse and throw away the ones that are not short and hence indicative of a, of a nuclear recoil. And so we throw away more than 10 to the eighth of the pulses in order to get to the ones that are of interest. So this is a picture of the snow lab. And there are a number of new areas, as you can see over here. And uh, this laboratory was created in order to try to bring uh, people from around the world to come and work in Canada with Canadians. And in fact, that's happening. Uh, there are a number of dark matter experiments. There is the Snow Plus experiment I mentioned. There's the HALO experiment, which uses those uh, 
uh, neutron detectors that used to be in Snow, and uh, University of Washington is involved in that as well, you can get a, an, a unique signal in the event of a, of a supernova happening when there's a big burst of neutrinos by using uh, uh, neutron detectors along with a large amount of lead. But if you look at the set of, of, of experiments that are happening, there's a wide variety of different materials that are being placed in this uh, uh, beam of, uh, uh, of uh, dark matter that we're moving through. Uh, the one I mentioned was argon. Uh, helium is another one. Damic is an experiment in which people at the University of Washington have been instrumental in the measurements so far. It uses silicon. Uh, Super CDMS is another major uh, experiment uh, about to start construction. They have a test facility already. It'll use silicon and germanium. And PICO is a type of experiment where you look for bubbles formed when the uh, dark matter hits. It uses fluorine. So we're covering a lot of materials. The facility itself is, is quite remarkable. There's very low radioactivity everywhere within the boundary. This shows Stephen Hawking visiting for the second time, in this case in 2012, about a year before he passed away. He was adamant he wanted to get underground and see what we're doing one more time because of its effect on overall uh, the understanding of the universe around us. And so you, so you see everybody else takes a shower and puts on clean clothing. In his case, we vacuum him off above ground in his wheelchair and put him in a, in a uh, filtered air uh, container in order to get there. The experiment I was referring to, the uh, DEEP experiment, uh, uses uh, uh, technology very similar to the snow experiment. These are the light sensors. Very carefully cleaned inner surface of the detector uh, along, uh, in, in, in doing this cleaning, these arms were, th this piece was vertical in order to go through the long uh, neck of our vessel. And then they opened up, there were rotating sanding disks, and then that rotated around to give a 360 cleaning of the inner surface. You do crazy things when you're trying to control radioactivity. The people working on the DEEP experiment have now joined forces with essentially everyone using liquid argon internationally. We have over 400 scientists from 14 countries uh, delivered uh, around the world, building a, a detector significantly, well, about 20 tons rather than three tons in a laboratory in Italy. And here we're adding uh, an electric field to produce a second signal at the top of the detector to help with our discrimination. Uh, and eventually we want to do a measurement back in Snow Lab with about 400 tons to try to get as far as we can before new neutrinos, ironically for me, before neutrinos interfere with your experiment rather than being the subject of your experiment. This gives you a feel for the scale of the, uh, uh, of the detector and it's taking place in the Gran Sasso Laboratory east of Rome, which isn't quite as deep as, as Snow Lab, but adequate for our purposes. We have to use underground argon, argon extracted from a carbon dioxide stream that comes from a well in Colorado that's used to pressurize oil wells in Texas in order to uh, uh, extract more oil from them. From our point of view, it has uh, in it uh, argon that has been away from the effects of cosmic rays in the atmosphere and, and, and a very critical radioactivity, an isotope of argon called argon-39 that otherwise would interfere in our experiment is suppressed by a factor of about 1400 and therefore makes that experiment possible. We're extracting it, we'll send it to, uh, to Italy to a purification column in a mine in uh, Sardinia. It's about the size of the, of the Eiffel Tower this is what you get when you have Europeans giving you a reference point. <laughs> it would be the Empire State Building probably here, but uh, anyway. Um, and uh, uh, we uh, then expect to get uh, high purity uh, in the experiment. It's under construction now and we expect to be running in 2026. So this is the most complicated thing in my whole talk, but I'm not sure how to say it to you any other way. What is plotted on the vertical axis here is 
the interaction of dark matter with ordinary matter. Uh, interaction in particular with one of the nucleons inside the ordinary matter. And what's plotted along the axis here on the right is the mass of that particular particle. <clears throat> what these lines show is the sensitivity of the various experiments. The ones that are shown as solid are the ones that have already taken place. And so we've been able to say that the interaction cross-section for, or interaction probability for dark matter to interact with ordinary matter is less, it's certainly above this line when you measure with argon, above this line when you measure with xenon, which is these other experiments here. The next generation of the xenon experiments, including one LZ that has already reported, indicating that they will probably get to this sensitivity, is shown in this dashed line. We expect with the 20 tons dark side experiment to get a little bit better than that, and with 400 tons, we're down to the point where, ironically, that is <laughs> what is our object in the original experiments and now is in our way. We've developed new detectors in order to do this. They're, they're quite remarkable. But what's also great about them is that there are people in our collaboration who are working on developing a new type of positron emission tomography using argon, using this type of detector. It would look like you see in the schematic diagram on the left. The number of these silicon photomultipliers, the new things, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, would involve about 100 square meters. In our detector, we're using about 20 square meters, which is the largest that anyone has brought together so far. What's nice about this technology is that you can reduce the dose a significant amount, and as a result, you may be able to then cheat, treat child patients, which has been a limitation up till now, simply by the amount of, of positron-emitting material that you inject into the patient. So the greater sensitivity would be a real advantage in this technology. And the other thing that indicates how the sort of capabilities that exist within uh, the ability to do these cutting edge <laughs> experiments, and it's true for <clears throat> essentially all of the ones I mentioned, including the ones that are being developed here at University of Washington, uh, can be applied to other things. And in the first eight months of the, co of the COVID pandemic, uh, a group of us from the dark side experiment together with national labs in Canada here and in the US and other countries came together. We had a we started in May. We had a, uh, uh, a design which we published freely as we were going along so that anyone could pick it up and start developing it in other countries. Uh, we started about May, uh, I think, 15th, and by May 31st, we had our first design published. We had the first uh, uh, production units working in, at the end of April. We got a Government of Canada contract which uh, enabled us after certification, which took a while, to eventually deliver 7,000 or so of these ventilators to the Canadian stockpile, where they are in fact now available for other countries in need of ventilators. It's targeted explicitly for intubated patients in the ICU, and uh, as a result, it has uh, more limited capabilities, but it's also about five times cheaper than uh, the main uh, ventilators that are on the market and were not available early in the, in the pandemic from lack of parts and so on. And uh, so it was a contribution of that nature. The wonderful thing about it was that all of these scientists said, you mean I can contribute something to help with this pandemic just using the expertise I already have? And uh, they really uh, worked very hard in order to do this. Uh, and uh, again, I'm very grateful to them as a collaboration. So in summary, we have a very complete knowledge of how our universe has evolved, with the exception of the detailed properties of, of, of dark matter and, and, uh, and dark energy, but we know how they have affected uh, the evolution through their gravitational interactions. The underground laboratory gives us a chance to do things that otherwise uh, uh, would be impossible, and scientists have cutting edge skills that end up being of value for the, uh, for the general public as well. 
Now, <clears throat> I'm told that there are no Tim Hortons in, in uh, Seattle. You know, I, I don't know whether that's, uh, whether that's uh, something to do with Starbucks or not, but uh, I know that my wife will only drink Starbucks, so I think probably there's other people that are kind of similar to that. But so I have to educate you a little bit so that you'd understand this particular clip I'm going to show you. At the time that I was attempting to explain on TV in Canada after the, the same week as the uh, Nobel Prize was, was announced, what I was trying to explain what neutrinos are and what we measured and why it was of importance to anyone. They called me up and said, we've written a script. Would you be willing to, uh, would you be willing to read it? Uh, I have to explain uh, a couple of things. One, Timbits are donut holes. They're uh, uh, served at Tim Hortons all across Canada. Uh, the, you may not know how extensive Tim Hortons are in Canada, but the definition of a small town in Canada is if you look out the window of your Tim Hortons and you can't see another Tim Hortons, then <laughs> you live in a small town. So they're, they're pretty ubiquitous. Um, so Tim Bits are the donut holes. They come in different flavors and so on. And then the other thing you have to understand in terms of the, the beginning of this is I'm from Cape Breton in Nova Scotia, and we are often the butt of jokes from people from Newfoundland who write this show. So let me see if, uh, if this will broadcast. Including Lester B. Pearson, Alice Monroe, and now a guy from Cape Breton. <laughs> Physicist Arthur McDonald is Canada's latest winner of a Nobel Prize. Here to explain why he's the best in the world at what he does is Art McDonald. Hi, I'm Art McDonald. I'm a professor emeritus at Queen's University, originally from Cape Breton, and I attended Dalhousie University. And I'm a co-winner of the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, people from uh, 22 Minutes have asked me to come in and explain what uh, I and our team did to win this prize. We demonstrated that the flavor of neutrinos produced in the core of the sun, electron neutrinos, changed into one of the other two flavors, muon and tau neutrinos, as they traveled from the core of the sun to, uh, okay, I'm, I'm being told I have to make it simpler. Um, <laughs> neutrinos are very basic subatomic particles that we don't know how to subdivide any further. And, okay, they're asking me to uh, dumb it down a little bit. Um, uh, a subatomic particle is uh, smaller than an atom. Atom is a unit of matter. Really? You don't know what matter is? <laughs> seven. Okay, uh, neutrinos are like Timbits. <laughs> Chocolate, uh, sometimes they're like um, uh, cherry filled, and sometimes they're like the uh, old fashioned glaze. I must be the first person that ever won a Nobel Prize in Timbits. <laughs> So, if you didn't understand the earlier stuff, I hope that helped. <laughs> By the way, in this country, uh, you can get munchkins at Dunkin' Donuts that are very similar and same flavors as neutrinos. So, they're all set. So, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to try to <laughs> take some questions if you'd like to come up to the microphones on either, either side. I have a, a question that's kind of off the wall, but um, since we've been talking about dark matter, and I have friends that 
constantly bug me about the difference between what's the evidence that supports dark matter over mond. Can you give like just a simple statement and if it's too far out of the uh, realm of what you're trying to get across here, you could just tell me to um, <clears throat> sit down. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch uh, what you said Oh, so was, um, was out of the art. Yeah, of the, the evidence that supports dark matter over MOND, modified Newtonian dynamics. Oh, M O N D, okay. Um, so there are people that say, uh, that put forward theories that uh, modify uh, uh, gravity in such a way that you can perhaps understand the way in which um, the uh, uh, effects uh, are observed, for example, in our galaxy, where um, where the stars are held in in place in the in this uh, model by uh, by the uh, uh, by the dark matter particles, uh, and they modify gravity in such a way that uh, that per phenomenon at least can be understood, and and some of the others as well, but. Uh, all I can say, I'm not an expert at those such a thing, about such things, but uh, as I understand it, it's very difficult to explain all of the phenomena that have been observed uh, by the astronomers uh, in terms of uh, measurements of, of how uh, the universe has behaved, which we now, I mean, we, we, we now have telescopes that can look back in time uh, to uh, for example, uh, a billion years after the, you know, can look back 12 billion years to try to understand how the universe is, is, was working at the time. And uh, so we have a remarkable set of data. And my understanding, and there are cosmologists here at University of Washington that know more about that than I do, uh, it's not really possible to explain things with a modified Newtonian gravity approach in comparison to what you find with uh, the theory that I put forward to you that uh, involves uh, dark matter, either axions or weakly interacting massive particles. So uh, uh, all I can say is the consensus within the com scientific community is uh, not in favor right now of modified new Newtonian dynamics. That's about all I can say. Yeah, hi. My question is something that, uh, on a subject that I know nothing about, but a friend asked me to ask if you would say anything about sterile neutrinos. <laughs> um, yes. So I spoke about <clears throat> three neutrino types. The type that we have observed in a number of instances to uh, be uh, actively interacting via the weak interaction. And uh, uh, we have a number of measurements of, uh, of the, uh, uh, that, that, that tell you um, the number of different neutrino types that there are. Some of them come from those cosmological fits I was talking about. Some of them also come from measurements that were done at the CERN accelerator in Geneva, where you look at, uh, uh, at effects that would be distorted if you had more than three uh, neutrino types. Uh, and so putting that all together, you end up with another neutrino type that doesn't interact the same way as the ones that uh, I was using in my descriptions of things, which are the more accepted ones. They're, they, they are more sterile, let's say, than the ones that we're very familiar with. <clears throat> the data associated with their existence which has come from a wide variety of experiments, has been fluctuating over the last 10 years or so between uh, data that was somewhat convincing uh, in some cases uh, to a situation now where there have been a several recent measurements that make it less likely that uh, <coughs> sterile neutrinos are in fact uh, demonstrated by these experiments. And, and None of the experiments actually came up with the properties of these particles 
that were similar to each other. And, and scientists often look for, uh, you know, across nature, things agreeing quite nicely with the properties of a theory that's put forward to say that sterile neutrinos, for an example, exist. And uh, none of them fit very well together anyway in the first place. But some of the recent experiments, including one with an experiment called Microboom, microboom at uh, Fermilab, uh, removed uh, some of the certainty that uh, some of the proponents thought proved that sterile neutrinos might exist. So, so the bottom line is you think they probably aren't any sterile neutrinos. The, the bottom line is that the consensus of, of the scientific community so far is that right now it doesn't look very good for sterile neutrinos. Thank you. Oh, hi. Hello, thank you for the good talk. Um, I guess <clears throat> what I want to ask is, um, you mentioned the, ADM, the ADMX experiment uh, that was searching for axions. Um, is there, how, how much overlap is there between the WIMP, the WIMP experiment, the SNOW Plus experiment, and um, the ADMX uh, being done at, uh, here at the University of Washington, and I guess, my bigger question is, does one disprove the other, um, or will you, are they, are they sort of, conf how conflicting are the two theories from one another? Um, so, uh, again, I'm not an expert on, on axions. There are people in the, in the audience here who could answer your question probably better than, than me, but uh, uh, the, uh, I don't think there's, uh, well, okay, maybe both exist. But more likely, it's one or the other in terms of understanding uh, the effects that are, are needed in order to understand how uh, uh, dark matter influences uh, uh, the evolution of the universe. Uh, axions are a very different uh, type of particle. They're much lower in mass. They even influence uh, the universe uh, different in the early stages than WIMPs do. Um, and, uh, and you detect them in a very different way you don't need to go underground. The measurements that are being done here, which are among the most sensitive in the world, are being done right in the laboratory at uh, uh, Nuclear Physics Laboratory or SEMPA. And uh, uh, there you're, do you're looking for uh, electromagnetic effects. And uh, uh, you just have to be very careful as you do that to, uh, to make the measurements appropriately. Um, I, I think it's uh, the consensus probably in the community would be either or, but uh, uh, it's not, I think, completely impossible that, that you could have both things occurring. Uh, uh, probably not, however. Thank you. Oh, hi. Now I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's just, experiments have a long history, so when you started designing snow... Sorry. Uh, when you started uh, designing snow, for, for many physicists, the fact that neutrino as neutrinos have mass and change flavor was a bit of a surprise. Was it a surprise to you when you were originally designing snow? Was that what you expected to see? Was it, uh, what was the story there? So, <clears throat> this all started in 1984. Um, there was a, uh, um, a scientist from the University of California at Irvine by the name of Herb Chen, who uh, had the audacity to ask if uh, it's possible to obtain enough heavy water to measure neutrinos from the sun. Uh, he originally proposed about uh, uh, 4,000 tons, which would have been $1.2 billion at the time and would have been all of the Canadian reserves. Uh, but uh, then he uh, subsequently uh, uh, visited an aquarium with his young daughter, who now is a principal scientist on the James Webb S Space Telescope, by the way, um, and, uh, and realized that perhaps uh, you could contain the water inside acrylic. Uh, Peter Doe from here was working with him, with Herb, uh, in Irvine at the time, and uh, <clears throat> from the very beginning worked on developing this acrylic vessel, which was a part of the design from, uh, well, I think, the second collaboration meeting we had in 1984. Um, and at the time, 
you know, it was a very, uh, very ambitious project. There were about 16 of us involved in the original group that came together that uh, eventually became, as you see, about 270 people who were authors on the papers. But uh, uh, Herb, unfortunately, uh, developed leukemia in 1987 and passed away. And uh, we still have a, uh, you know, a very uh, fond memory of him and, a, and, and he really is a, uh, a person that we uh, respect tremendously in terms of the idea in the first place. But when he put forward the idea, the, the, uh, the people who controlled the heavy water in Canada, Atomic Energy of Canada, uh, senior scientists there were physicists. People, actually, one of the physicists who, uh, who uh, uh, was involved was a fellow named Jeff Hanna, who worked with Bruno Pontecorvo when he was at Chalk River. Uh, Bruno Pontecorvo was one of the people that proposed that neutrinos could oscillate. Um, and so he understood what was involved in the physics and, and, and was in senior management and, and convinced other people in management that maybe they could loan one quarter of their reserves. Uh, and so very early on, we had a commitment from them to do that. And there had already been work by George Ewan in looking for an underground laboratory location in Canada. And he had convinced INCO, the mining company at the time that owned the mine, that uh, uh, good science could be done underground. And so those two things were available. And then the question was, could you, could you actually do it? So we knew that we would either learn <laughs> properties of neutrinos that would be very fundamental, or we'd learn properties of how the sun burns that would be very fundamental if we could only do the experiment. And that's where uh, people like uh, Hamish and others came in. And at that point, we worked it out. We could do it, we thought. And we managed to convince the funding agencies by the, we started in 1984, we got the money in 1990 and started uh, building things. So uh, uh, it was an interesting period, lots of head scratching and design changes and so on. But uh, the inspiration to do good science uh, was what really drove it. And, uh, and it was doing good science that, that influenced everybody involved in the experiment Winning a Nobel Prize is not the sort of thing that people had in mind. What they were thinking about is, can we make an impact and can we improve our understanding of the universe around us? And so our eureka moment on this experiment came in 2002, not in 2015. So. Hi. So this is a little bit of a historical question. My dad, from in the 30s, told me that he rejoiced at the time when the atom was split. And then somewhere along the line, might I have been a teenager in the 50s or 40s when the neutrino was first thought to exist? What is the inception in that? And by the way, before you even answer that, thank you for a wonderful lecture seeing the evolution of all that has been done. This has just been marvelous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But a little bit of history. So rephrase, rephrase the central sentence of the question. When did we start to think there was such a thing as a neutrino and why the name neutrino? Okay. Um, so. Um, you saw the spectrum of two neutrino double beta decay, a continuous spectrum. And the reason it's continuous is that uh, you're emitting a neutrino and an electron. And the energy is distributed between the neutrino and the electron. And so if you only can observe the electrons in a normal beta decay, which is, uh, you know, there are radioactive sources that you can observe those electrons, you find this continuous spectrum. What's happening there? What, energy is not being conserved. Is that a possibility? And the answer was given by Pauli that perhaps there was a, uh, uh, another particle being emitted that, uh, I mean, he, he said, uh, I've done a terrible thing. I've created a particle that nobody will ever detect. And, uh, but it was, it had become a sort of an accepted uh, precept that there were neutrinos being emitted. I think neutrino actually came 
they were originally called neutrons, I believe, but uh, uh, Enrico Fermi gave them the name neutrino, okay. if I'm remembering history correctly. And they were eventually observed directly by Fred Rhinus, who was a colleague of Herb Chen's at the University of, uh, of Irvine, California, and he won a Nobel Prize for the first observation of neutrinos. They were actually anti-neutrinos emitted by nuclear reactions in a, in a nuclear reactor. And uh, he made measurements uh, outside the nuclear reactor that uh, could only be explained by these neutrino particles being emitted in the nuclear reactions in the reactor. And that took place somewhere around 1953. The original uh, Pauli um, suggestion was about 1930. So it took quite a while before they were actually right. physically observed. So I think that's... Thank you very question. much. It, it turns out that my dad inadvertently didn't know this, but he was actually working at the Fermi lab in huh. Chicago during World War II. But it was so secret, they didn't know. Thank you very much. Well, what's, what's now Fermi Lab was a part of the Manhattan Project, actually, at that time. Interesting. Um, are there any neutrino experiments going on right now, or can you dream up any that have something to say about how neutrinos get mass instead of just the value of the mass? Um, <clears throat> well, uh, the... the model that has been put forward that seems to work very well in many instances is a model where um, the flavors are expressed, the three flavors are expressed in three uh, mass states. It's a quantum mechanical phenomenon. And uh, there are a number of experiments going on uh, that are uh, using this formalism to attempt to understand further properties of the neutrinos including one major property that uh, is needed in order for neutrinos to actually be a proper explanation for why the antimatter decayed away in the early universe. Uh, and uh, uh, there are uh, big experiments um, at uh, Fermilab, the Dune experiment in particular, where Fermilab is shooting a beam to the uh, uh, underground laboratory in South Dakota where Ray Davis first did his measurements of solar neutrinos and another experiment in Japan called Hyper-K that uh, is attempting to do the same thing. They're testing in quite a bit of detail uh, in these experiments the uh, formalism that uh, describes um, how neutrinos change their mass. Now, the formalism of how they get their mass is, is, a, is a very complicated theoretical uh, project, and, and it, it has to do also with... Uh, type of neutrino that has a, a very heavy mass, uh, one of the heaviest masses we know, uh, and that mechanism is what is, is put forward to explain uh, this antimatter asymmetry at the, uh, uh, at the uh, uh, early universe. Uh, those neutrinos will not be accessible with experiments here on Earth. And so all we can do is for look for chinks in the uh, <laughs> formalism for neutrinos that are accessible here and measurements we do on Earth. And then the theorists are uh, uh, putting forward the ways in which neutrino mass is, is uh, generated, uh, and that relates also to how they have influence in the early universe in this asymmetry that is developed. So it's a, it's a total picture question rather than being able to probe exactly uh, the origin of that mass. I hope that's of help. <laughs> Thank you. So be beyond that? Hi. Beyond that, what do we still not know about neutrinos and, and how might we find out? Okay, so uh, I mentioned uh, part of it. Um, one of the things we don't know is whether they are their own antiparticle, which is quite possible uh, for in this case, and that has uh, implications. They need to be their own antiparticle in order for this neutrinoless double beta decay to take place. Uh, if we observe neutrinoless double beta decay, it will be proof that they are, in fact, their own antiparticle. Um, we don't know, uh, in terms of these three masses I mentioned, and I didn't get into the details of that theory because we would have had 
equations filling the screen, and we don't want that tonight. Uh, the, uh, uh, the question of uh, is mass 2 greater than mass 1 was answered uh, for neutrinos coming from the sun because they interact with the electrons in the sun as they come through, and it gives us information that enables us to say that. Uh, the question of whether mass 3 is greater than the other two or not is a question that's unknown. Uh, this parameter that uh, I mentioned that uh, has an effect on the asymmetry uh, in the early universe, uh, it's a delta, is the Greek letter used to describe it, is one of the objectives of the measurements in uh, uh, Fermilab and, and in Japan. Uh, sterile neutrinos is still an open question, uh, le less favored than it was a few years ago, but still an open uh, question. Um, and a number of the parameters are very close to uh, numbers that would be uh, very symmetric in their, uh, very, very close to a, a symmetry principle in physics and uh, measuring them accurately, which there will also be done in the experiments I mentioned, uh, is another way to try to have the, ex the theories that describe how the mass is generated, uh, let's say, uh, what, what's the symmetry? Or ruled out. What's the symmetry principle? What is? What is the symmetry that they're very close to? Um, well, it's really just a question of whether the value of a particular parameter is a maximum value that might occur if there were a certain symmetry that are put into the theories. So uh, it's those sorts of questions. We've learned a lot, but not everything yet. Thank you. Hi, so I want to ask uh, something related to... Could, could you speak oh. loudly? Okay, so I want to ask about dark matter, your insight on the dark matter search. Like, uh, Snow, Snow Lab now holds a number of dark matter experiments, such as WIMPs mainly. And it's very likely... I'm going to come over closer. <laughs> I so I'm, I'm still not loud enough, right? <laughs> How about now? So I, I want to ask about your insight on the, on the, on the future of uh, dark matter search. Like Snow, Snow Lab now holds a number of dark matter search experiments. And as your project, uh, the pro projection of the sensitivity on the WIMP search um, landscape, it's very likely, like after 10 or 20 years, we'll touch down the neutrino floor, and which is the coherent neutrino nuclear scattering. And then what's the next? So do you have, like, it, it sounds like uh, those experiments are sort of expensive. And after building them up, and we saw those um, coherent neutrino nuclear scatterings, which are just within standard model. And if we still didn't, uh, we still don't find out wings. And what, what should we do next? <laughs> so, uh, I'll grab that microphone and speak over here instead of running across the, the uh, instead of running across to the other side. Um, so, uh, okay. The situation is that, um, there are many theories that have come forward that are not explicitly WIMPs or axions. They're, uh, let's say they involve a greater number of uh, other uh, interactions that are unknown, uh, but they can produce uh, WIMPs that are, or WIMP-like particles that are lower mass than the ones that uh, we are sensitive to in our experiments. We are still encouraged by theorists to push as far as we can in the energy region or in the mass region that we're currently working on until we have exhausted as much as we can do in that particular case. But at the same time, there are a number of people who are studying other things for lighter mass neutrinos, and in some cases, uh, neutrinos that penetrate, or particles that are dark matter particles that are produced in accelerator by accelerator beams, penetrate through the shielding, and have properties that could match dark matter, uh, and, and, and a lot of things like that that people are pursuing. Uh, so there are many other, theorists are extremely creative in looking for other things. 
Uh, I don't think it's possible to push very far past the neutrino floor. We have a bit of an, an advantage in the uh, argon, the use of argon, because we can eliminate essentially completely boron-8 neutrinos from the sun because they produce electron recoils and we can discriminate them very well. But the baseline is coherent neutrino scattering from atmospheric neutrinos. And that, fortunately, is being measured rather directly in some beautiful experiments at Oak Ridge by the coherent collaboration, including the use of an argon detector. And so in terms of understanding the interaction of atmospheric neutrinos with our detector, that will be very well defined by the time we get to that point. So uh, I hope I answered a, uh, the breadth of your question. So you mentioned in your talk that maybe once in a person's life we might experience a neutrino hitting our eye and then seeing like a flash of light or something. Okay, um, I've, I've heard that at, <laughs> right. I've heard that astronauts in, in the International Space Station, because of the cosmic rays, see flashes of light in their eyes when they close their eyes to fall asleep. Um, that's, the, uh, that's the Northern Lights. Yep, yeah, exactly. So we know that the cosmic rays interact with our atmosphere, and that's what causes, sort of causes the Northern Lights. Do we know if the neutrinos interact with our atmosphere? And do we know of a way to detect neutrinos in space, not just on Earth? Um, okay. There are many questions in what you just asked. Sure. Um, neutrinos are... Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. So there are a number of questions in, in what you just asked. Um, the uh, question of... Uh, uh, well, in the atmosphere, neutrinos are generated by cosmic rays. And in fact, the other half of the Nobel Prize that we were awarded uh, went for uh, the observation of those neutrinos, which changed their flavor over a distance corresponding to one side of the Earth to the other. Uh, those measurements were made by the Super Kamiokande experiment in Japan. And so neutrinos are produced in the atmosphere by the cosmic rays. Uh, the atmosphere, uh, I mean, there are relatively few interactions of the, those neutrinos with the atmosphere itself. Uh, a small number, perhaps, but uh, uh, trying to make a measurement in space, the problem is that uh, in order to have a high probability of observing neutrinos, you have to have a lot of atoms for them to bang into. And that's simply the fact that you can't build a massive enough, or you can't fly a massive enough experiment in order to do measurements of neutrinos in space. But the fact that they penetrate the atmosphere very uh, readily uh, enables you to do measurements here on Earth. The atmosphere is kind of irrelevant. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's a fantastic array of different experiments. Uh, one of them that uh, just made an announcement last week is the ice cube experiment, where they have in instrumented one cubic kilometer of ice under the South Pole. and. Uh, there, what they observe is very high energy neutrinos that uh, are energetic enough to produce light. And these are sensed by uh, photo detectors that are, uh, that are situated in the ice. They basically drill into the ice with hot water and put in these sensors and let it freeze around them. Uh, and so they've instrumented this. What they just announced is that they have observed neutrinos that they can attribute to a black hole a known black hole. And uh, uh, that is, has been the speculation as to one of the mechanisms for generating these neutrinos, which are very interesting from an astronomical point of view, because they aren't bent by magnetic, intergalactic magnetic fields. They penetrate through uh, all the material between where they're produced and here. And so in terms of studying the most, the farthest reaches uh, of the universe and, and, and studying the highest energies uh, things produced, neutrinos are great. And so this was really quite a, a, a monumental uh, announcement last week uh, by the Ice Cube experiment. So uh, uh, you don't have to worry about flying things in space. You can do it here on Earth, and they're doing it. So, okay.
Well, uh, thank you, Professor McDonald. With that question, we're going to end the Q&A. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here. I found my brochure. We don't have, uh, we haven't announced the spring lecture yet, uh, but you can scan the QR code and it will appear in our list of events. So let's thank one last time to Professor McDonald. Thank you very much. It was excellent. Thank you. Okay. Have a good evening. <laughs>